Thank you, uh, Mike. I appreciate very much uh, uh, the invitation to speak at the Harris Center and to uh, and for all of you to have come out to hear. I can tell you, although the emergency exit has been identified, I don't intend to send anybody to it. Um, uh, this is a big subject to cover, which reminds me of a story about Winston Churchill, uh, sort of appropriate. Uh, late in his administration as prime minister, he was visited by the women of the Temperance Association, uh, and looked, looked up the high walls of his office and said, well, if all the cognac you've drunk in your life was put in this room, it would be halfway up the walls. And he said, so much to do, so little time to do it. Uh, I also have to confess a personal, if somewhat once removed, attachment to all of this. Uh, the Upper Churchill Project uh, revealed the existence of a canyon down from the falls. And that canyon was first investigated by a graduate of Bowdoin College in Maine, my alma mater. And that canyon is known till today as the Bowdoin Canyon. And I wonder if people knew that this was named after one of the revolutionary governors of Massachusetts, if that would, uh, if that would still continue. But I've just, we've just come, my wife and I have just come from a, a trip around Labrador and visited the Bowdoin Canyon, to be sure. Uh, I appreciate the background introduction uh, that I've been given. I, I want to just emphasize the role that I play. Uh, I, for AIMS, which for some people, there's a belief it has an ideological orientation. I have never been given instructions or edited as to what I say, what I write, in terms of my own uh, opinions and observations about Atlantic Canada. Uh, so whatever some people may think about its ideology, I've never been subject to any ideological control. I try to provide objective, non-political risk analysis based upon experience from elsewhere. I don't make go, no go recommendations. I leave that to the people in the provinces to do. What I try to do is lay out potential actions, what I see the benefits and risks to be. You might say this is, these are observations by an informed outsider. I clearly stay out of the politics. I'm not Canadian uh, and, and, and therefore have no particular stake in the outcome of elections and politics here. So I say what I say without knowing who that may please or displease politically. What I'm going to talk about today is this. The Muskrat Falls project has several positive attributes which make it potentially worthwhile, but it imposes great risk on the province's electric customers. Though the project is advancing, there remains a range of useful actions that can draw even more benefit from it and reduce customer risk. And, and that's where I'm going in my talk today. First, a bit of background in my own thinking about what I saw in considering this. And I've been writing about this for Ames for two or three years by now. One is the great influence of the existing Upper Churchill Falls project and the Hydro-Quebec deal. Uh, obviously, I don't think anybody in this room needs to have explained the background of it. But clearly, its existence has had a great influence in the thinking about Muskrat Falls, that uh, the, the problems that arose from that deal should not be repeated, uh, and that uh, there should be a reluctance, there would be a reluctance of entering into the same kind of relationship with anybody, and especially Hydro-Quebec, uh, as was characteristic of the first deal. Uh, and that brings, uh, that is what in part brought Emera into the picture under a different relationship and the Hydro-Quebec relationship uh, as a way to help out with the development of the project uh, without uh, encountering the kind of problems that arose uh, from Hydro-Quebec. Secondly, and this is not surprising, but it's very noticeable to somebody from outside, is the insular view. This is an island, after all, 
and it's an energy island. It's an electric island. It's not connected to anything else. And that is very unusual in North America to be able to find a market this large that is this uh, uh, disconnected from the rest of the North American grid. Uh, you have to go to Alaska and Hawaii in the U.S. to, to find a, a parallel. Uh, and uh, while, therefore, a relationship with the mayor turned out to be helpful to the project, uh, it still led that kind of thinking, that kind of approach to the imposing of the risk of a major capital project, which this clearly is, on Newfoundland Labrador customers. Third observation when I was looking at this is this is a pure electric deal, and it's like many other electric utilities have done. Uh, but in this case, it was made with political rather than regulatory approval. Uh, that left a single regulator in the picture, and it wasn't in this province. It was in Nova Scotia. The UARB in Nova Scotia became the only regulatory body that got to make the traditional kind of utility regulatory analysis of rate impacts, alternatives, underlying issues, and so on. And th that kind of review was left to political judgments in this province and regulatory judgments in that province. Uh, and that produces somewhat different results. Uh, it doesn't answer the question uh, when you don't use a regulatory proceeding about the prudence of the project or whether the resulting rates are, in the traditional terms of utility regulation, just and reasonable. Uh, and, and that simply didn't take place. Fourth general observation, which applies not only to this province, but to all the provinces of Atlantic Canada, is each pro province really looks at self-sufficiency, using its own resources as much as possible, clearly not the case for PEI, and increasingly not the case for Nova Scotia. Uh, but there is a lack of a regional solution to electric uh, industry problems and challenges. Uh, I had the opportunity to participate somewhat in the Atlantic Gateway discussions about uh, the electricity sector. I was clearly the only non-Canadian in the room. Uh, and uh, not, that's been a lot of talk without much by way of results. And that's an indication of this segmented province by province approach that's characteristic. What did I see as the benefits of Muscat Falls? And these are benefits which are somewhat for this province, but also for uh, the larger world. One is that it would add a major new renewable resource to the energy mix in the northeastern, in northeastern North America. Uh, and would reduce inevitably somewhat the need for new fossil fuel generation. Uh, this is desirable both for environmental reasons and for political economic reasons. It's indigenous, it's here, uh, and so the dependence on imports uh, that we in New England have particularly been sensitive to uh, is greatly reduced. It would of course, and Newfoundland, the energy island that is Newfoundland, by the new transmission interconnections. Uh, and let me say, in my view, and I come from a somewhat transmission background, perhaps the most significant piece of the Muskrat Falls project is not the generator, but the transmission line. Uh, not only linking Labrador and uh, Newfoundland, but uh, the maritime link itself is of huge importance. I don't know if people are aware that just by the creation of the maritime link, the link between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick becomes firmer at a higher capacity without any hardware additions whatsoever. It's a, that's a major event. Uh, and uh, the project may lead to the development of an export product that can produce revenues that will offset its cost, that could offset its cost, and could benefit the province economically. So those are what I see as the benefits. What are the risks? Well, that it won't do what was promised, that people accepted the project uh, based upon what was offered, and that somehow that won't happen. Uh, I've heard some criticisms resulting from the need 
to, uh, for an increased commitment to EMERA, that that would leave inadequate power for Newfoundland and Labrador, a matter which I'll come back to as not necessarily having to be the case, but it's a risk. The project cost is likely to increase, which increases the risk to customers. There's no major capital project, I think, that has ever been done where the project cost didn't increase. I mean, and I think anybody who takes the initial price they hear about any major capital project and believes, oh, well, that's it. It's a, it's a bargain at that price is kidding themselves. They just always get more expensive. The sale of excess power is unknown and uncertain. How much, how reliable, how long, and to whom are all questions that are not yet answered and therefore uh, raise risks. And if you look at, New Eng at the New England market, we're seeing changes in that market of three kinds. One, the increased participation of shale gas from the Atlantic region at very reasonable prices that year, a few years ago we would have never imagined happening. Two, the development of wind power, mostly in Maine, which is now being bought throughout New England so that everybody can meet their requirements for renewable purchases. Uh, I love this line, we're the Saudi Arabia of wind. I always, I always point out the sheiks actually own the oil and we don't own the wind, so it's not it's not that great, but there's a lot of wind developments in Maine. And finally, and importantly, the use of uh, distributed generation and conservation, which has caused, at least for the moment in New England, a leveling off of demand, that there's been enough growth in demand response, distributed generation, and other conservation measures that the market is changing. Another risk is if the revenues that come from off-system sales are not flowed back as a credit against the cost of the project to the customer. If you don't do that, I have to say, based upon experience, this would be a very unusual project. Certainly where a project is regulated, the regulator always requires that. But the general regulatory rule is that off-system sales, whether use of your transmission system by other people or sales of power to other people, produce revenues, and those revenues are used as a credit against the rate you charge your own customers. And that, uh, that's a risk if that doesn't happen. There's also been some concern about reliability, which I won't go into in detail. If there are questions, we can come back to it. I don't regard this, that as much of a concern, as much of a risk. I mention it because other people have mentioned it. Uh, we have a lot of experience with reliability, after all, the existing connection from Upper Churchill to Hydro-Quebec has been there for quite a while, so we've learned an awful lot about its reliability. Uh, and, in, and it's clear that the moment that NALCOR is connected by the maritime link to Nova Scotia, it's going to have to start following the rules of the Northeast Power Coordinating Council, the NPCC, which is a subsidiary of the North American Electric Reliability organization, which is now the reliability organization mandated in the United States and accepted by virtually all of the Canadian provinces that are interconnected with the United States. And so if you're interconnected with a utility that's interconnected even, inevitably you have to follow the reliability rules that are there. And it seems to me that's a problem that's going to take care of itself. Nobody is going to allow an unreliable system to be created. Now, let's turn to the regional benefits that I see coming from the project. Viewing Muskrat Falls as a regional resource can reduce the risk to the province itself. If it isn't seen as our project by people in the province, but rather as an Atlantic Canada project, you immediately get other entities able to participate in benefiting from the project and financially contributing to it. It's my view, as you will see, that a regional approach to the use of Muskrat Falls and its associated transmission will actually benefit everybody who's involved. And the most benefit uh, here will flow to ratepayers because it will take some of the risk off and produce some revenues that are useful 
in, in mitigating the cost to customers. Uh, as I've said, the most significant element of the Muskrat Falls project, in my view, is transmission. The minute you're interconnected with the rest of the world, I know it's only 500 megawatts, but it's 500 megawatts more than you have now, and it flows both ways, furthermore. I think uh, you have an, a, an enormous asset and a, and a good first step toward a regional relationship elsewhere. It will be easier to upgrade a 500 megawatt line between uh, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia than it will be to build the first one. So I think it's a, an excellent first step. A regional rely and and I have proposed uh, that reliability ought to be looked at on a regional basis. Under the NPCC, every interconnected system is required to have a reliability co uh, coordinator, somebody who's responsible for making sure that the system is reliable. That's the first element of an electric utility, that it be reliable, that when you turn the switch, the light comes on. And uh, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's investor-owned or state-owned or provincial-owned or, or whatever, that's the first obligation of an electric utility. Uh, and that can be accomplished on a system-by-system -system basis, but it's preferable to accomplish that on a regional basis. The New England Power Pool, with which I'm very familiar, was created in 1972 following the 1965 Northeast blackout, which took down a large part of the country uh, through a cascading effect. And at that point, six states of New England, uh, small states really in area, uh, very analogous to the small provinces of Atlantic Canada in terms of their electric load, decided they had to get together and pool their resources in a way that would operate their systems for greater reliability. And they did it beginning in 1972, and it, and it worked extremely well. Uh, and that was a power pool, but it really at its essence, what I'm talking about, it was a, reliable, a regional reliability coordinator. And now that's exactly what it is. It's a designated regional reliability coordinator. And that is an invaluable contribution to maintaining reliability anywhere on the system. Uh, I understand that there have been views expressed, well, the relationship with Nova Scotia can be a surrogate for a regional reliability coordinator, and I disagree with that. I think uh, these are all pretty small systems. If you take Atlantic Canada as a whole, it's a pretty small system as the world goes. And uh, the region would be better off involving as many resources as possible in the production of reliability. Also, there's no certainty Nova Scotia Power will have adequate resources available to back up any neighboring systems. It may be that you have to go to New Brunswick or possibly even beyond. But certainly, uh, the benefit would be to have a regional coordinator. And the discussions I was involved in uh, in the Atlantic Gateway, that was the focus. But unfortunately, it hasn't gone anywhere. There's been no result for that. So that's one thing, one element of it. Another element of a, of a regional approach to reliability is shared resources. You need to have the ability, and this is a rule now in North America, to back up your first contingency, the largest single generator on your system, immediately. And the second one, increasingly we're saying you have to be able to back up in 30 minutes. Uh, that's the n plus n minus 1 minus 1 theory. Uh, well, if you're an isolated province, you know what your largest generator is. And you have to back it up in that province. If you're connected to three other provinces, you then look at the largest single generator that can be dispatched and the size of transmission line matters, that can be dispatched anywhere to meet a problem. And that then becomes your principal reserve. And you only have to have one of them. You only have to have four of them. And so that immediately produces savings for the system because you have to buy reserves that say used to be traditionally 20% of 
your peak of your maximum demand, which is a lot, uh, and if everybody's got to do that, it ends up costing customers more. If you can share reserves through a reliability arrangement, you can lower costs. And, simp and that now becomes possible to at least some degree for this province at the moment that the maritime link exists. So that's a, that's a matter that I think is, you know, as I say, brain dead easy thought of and pursued. Uh, then we move to the idea of a, of a power pool, which I have been promoting, after having backed down through various levels of market suggestions, which clearly are not popular uh, in Atlantic Canada. I come back to where we started from in the US in the 60s and 70s, and that's a power pool. What a power pool does is different from a market and preferable to a market and advantageous, in my view, to Muskrat Falls. Uh, what a power pool says is whoever owns the generator has to recover the capital cost from whoever they would have reco recovered the capital cost to begin with. If it's a if it's a Newfoundland if it's a Nalcor project, Nalcor is going to recover the capital cost from Nalcor customers, but it can get some benefit from the energy side uh, in that energy is dispatched in a power pool, not on the basis of what people bid. The bid system, in my view, has been largely a failure, but on the basis of what it costs. Well, wait a minute, hydro doesn't cost anything. Will we be giving our power away? No, because hydro is the lowest cost power, since there is no fuel cost, an artificial price is created for hydro, and so essentially that goes back and contributes to your capital cost because you have you have incurred no cost to produce the energy. The money you get out of the pool is available to, count, to pay for the sum of the cost of the, of the capacity. So a that's how a power pool works. Dispatch every hour is based upon the lowest cost available energy in the interconnected pool. There is no question that hydro coming out of any province, whether it's Mactaquac in New Brunswick or Muskrat Falls in Labrador, will always be dispatched. Uh, and therefore, there will always be a revenue stream. And in my view, that reduces risk from saying, well, we're going to play in the spot market. Because we, as I've said, we don't know anything about that market years in the future. But we do know how a pool works. And we do know that hydro will be dispatched. The other advantage of it vis-a-vis -vis Muskrat Falls is that uh, if along comes an industrial customer who wants to buy the energy, you can withdraw the unit from the pool. You're not obliged to keep it in the pool permanently. There's no commitment this has to be. You can make an arrangement in some power pools, and we got to that in New England, where you are obliged to commit it to the pool. Uh, and you get some economic benefit for doing that. But if you don't want to do that, you don't have to do that. In fact, if you don't want to commit certain units on your system to the pool but keep them off, you can do that. Uh, there's a great deal of flexibility for the participants, but obviously there's a lot of advantages for them. And so the pool provides incentives to participate, not compulsion to participate, which enables the participants always to evalu evaluate the alternative is better I take this out of the pool and sell it to XYZ Corporation or not uh, and let them buy power however they can, however they're allowed to. Uh, a final step that is the last thing we did in, the, in the, the negotiations of which I was the chair in New England, which is to create, instead of four separate transmission rates, as would prevail in the Maritimes and Newfoundland and Labrador, one transmission rate, homogenize, have, go to a postage stamp rate for the entire region. This is, I know, radical talk in Canada. But I have to tell you, we did it, and it worked. Uh, and it worked very well. And because otherwise, Nalcor exporting to ICE in New England has to pay its own transmission rate, and it must have a transmission rate if it's going to be exporting to the US, because that's what the reciprocity requirement says. 
if hypothetically a U.S. utility wanted to sell in Newfoundland, it, have to, it would have to know what the transmission rate is. It has to pay its own transmission rate, Nova Scotia's transmission rate, New Brunswick transmission rate, and then get to the U.S. and pay Iceland New England's transmission rate. That's called pancaking. And, and you have enough layers, enough pancakes, it's not worth doing. If you could have a single homogenized, which comes out to be really a weighted average rate in the region, you don't get to it in year one. It took us 12 years in New England, gradually phasing it in. But you create a single homogenized rate. Every transmission owner gets paid what they would have gotten paid. They have one customer, which is the pool. They don't have to look for customers. They know they're going to get paid. And everybody uh, contributes to the use of this rate. Uh, and finally, you can have pool planning. And pool planning says, we need for the reliability of our system in, Atl in Atlantic Canada more generation or more transmission. And we'll pay, we'll, we'll allow somebody to build a generator if they commit to the pool with that generator. And if they do, everybody will chip in and pay the cost of transmission. So you have pool, so-called pool plan units and pool plan transmission. Uh, and that was done, uh, functions. Uh, it's a little radical from where we are today in, in Atlantic Canada, but it is still uh, out there as something you get to along the way. I hope what I've indicated is the regional benefits here kind of are incremental. You don't have to do everything all at once. There are advantages to doing them. And as you do each of them, it reduces the risk of having Muskrat Falls or any project depend entirely on the, the native load, as it's called, the customers of this province, uh, because other customers are benefiting from it and paying for it. Uh, and and you can then proceed to capture more benefits uh, as you get used to how this all works. So as far as I'm concerned, the reliability coordinator is self-evident. ought to be done. No skin off anybody's nose. It actually, actually saves you a little bit of money rather than having four or three reliability coordinators. You only have one. It can be done by one office instead of four offices. But it also produces be real benefit. Finally, just some observations of mine uh, that are personal, and I probably haven't written them, and then I'll wind up. One, I think Nalcor uh, is entering into a new world, uh, particularly if it's my world, of a regional relationship. And it doesn't have yet a lot of familiarity with it. That's my observation, uh, and, uh, and I think it needs to gain more. Two, there seem to be locked in positions on this project, on both sides, on all sides. I mean, either you ought to tear it down, whatever you've done, fill it back in, or I can't touch the proposal as it's been made because uh, if I give any ground to anybody, on anything about this project, they're going to want they'll take that as an opening to do even more damage, and I think that's uh, that's counterproductive. A third a third observation: there is a lack of regulatory review, and Nalcor should be treated as a regulated utility, not an unregulated business. Now, obviously, a lot has happened to really be very trite. A lot of water has gone over the dam already on this project, but. There, I think time remains for a PUB investigation to determine what flexibility there is in the existing deal, not to go back and sort of say who's at fault for what happened before. Whatever happened, happened. And there shouldn't be going back. Fault finding isn't going to do anybody any good. But what flexibility is there? Uh, how can the project be improved with the flexibility there is? And what other opportunities are there along the lines of what I've been talking about that could reduce the risk in the province? What you had in the absence of that, and I come back to say it again, is a single regulator who, which favored its own province, 
which is perfectly normal. But what happens in that, and I've seen it happen in the US too, is what we call beggar thy neighbor policies, where one regulator gets the jump and favors its own utility, and somebody else in another state pays the price. And I think that uh, uh, if a PUB investigation here would send a message, not only in this province, but in that province, that uh, you know we're going to look out for our situation here as well. Let me say, along the lines of what Mike said at the beginning, uh, I'm not going to pay attention with price forecasts. I used to do a lot of them. I think they're mostly worthless because there's so much we don't know about the future. So that when you say, well, 20 years from now, this will be cheaper than that will be 20 years from now, I flat say I don't believe it. I don't know what it'll be 20 years from now. Could we have actually predicted that the US would be a net oil exporting country this year, that it would, uh, that we'd have gas uh, prices a third of what they used to be because of the discovery of shale gas and the use of fracking? No. 10 years ago, that none of that was imaginable. So I can't tell what's going to happen five years from now, much less 10 years from now. So I think pr comparing price forecasts is much less good than looking at a broader view of the project. And I think, getting back to that, this is a very good project in a broad sense of it's a renewable energy project. It's in the Northeast. It, it opens new transmission links that are of value to the region, but it imposes considerable risks. And you've got to use the advantages to mitigate the risks better than has been done. Two more things. It's shown that the transmission part of it, which I keep coming back to, has shown its value already. I think it will reveal the need for more transmission rather than more generation as time goes by. That, uh, that an enhanced maritime link will, I think, occur to people reasonably soon as being of real value. And my final point is it seems to me that this province, with the impetus of Muskrat Falls, has the opportunity to go back to the other provinces in a way that hasn't happened before and take a regional leadership position and say, we want to use this resource that we're developing as a regional benefit. Sure, we'll get some help if we do that, but so will you. And let's sit down and start talking about an enhanced regional relationship which will produce benefit both here and there. Thank you. I hope I haven't overdone my time, and I'll be glad to take questions or comments.